Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 711. Today we're going to talk about Stargrave. This is a new book coming out from Osprey Games and designer Joseph McCullough, coming out here in a, probably a couple of weeks. And if the name sounds familiar, that's because it was also designed by Joseph McCullough, who is the designer of Frostgrave, also published by Osprey. This is the second edition book. If you've not heard of Frostgrave, I do have some links below to some of the videos I've done for it, the original review and second edition review and so on. Uh, but to be really circumspect and probably a little bit glib about it, Stargrave is basically Frostgrave, but in a space setting. So in this particular case, you will be having a crew with the captain and a first mate and a kind of a war band of soldiers going on sort of treasure hunting expeditions all over all the planets of the galaxy. Uh, kind of the backdrop is there's been a war that sort of just decimated all communication and civilization in the galaxy. So it's a lot of, you know, burnt out husks and abandoned worlds and all that kind of stuff. So there's a little bit of that background in here as well. But you'll be taking your warband or your crew through a campaign, playing over several uh, games, you know, leveling up your captain and your first mate and so on, getting gear, getting treasures and that kind of stuff. Uh, you're going to be playing a game on a three by three table was set up with probably hopefully full of terrain, although you can kind of play around with that yourself. Uh, but what I'm going to do with this review is I'm gonna go in now and kind of do my normal kind of how to play. Now, if you've played Frostgrave or maybe like Rangers of Shadow Deep or Frostgrave Ghost Archipelago, a lot of what I'm gonna tell you is gonna be super familiar, but there are some different key differences in the system. But the basic general core is the same. It's a D20 system. Uh, the way that you activate abilities in this case is kind of the same as spells and so on. But there is some key differences. So if you wanna watch that, you know, go through that. I will be kind of talking in kind of the postscript and the review part of it about some of those differences in a more general, like, you know, emotional, touchy-feely way and how the, you know, how the gameplay kind of feels. Uh, but let's go down to the table. I'm not gonna show you every rule because this is, uh, you know, a couple, a couple hundred pages of rules basically. Uh, but I'll go through some of the stuff. So let's jump down and then I'll come back. Okay, so here's the three foot by three foot table of the last game that I played of this. Uh, not really relevant, but uh, you know, this is just a, uh, what a table might look like full of terrain. Uh, personally, just to kind of side note, Stargave gives me a very rogue trader vibe. Uh, so my crews have been sort of in that vein. So for example, here you can see a rogue trader here. This is Janice Drake. He's from the Blackstone Fortress board game. And he is one of my crew captains. And he's accompanied by a, uh, an inquisitor looking fellow there, if we can focus up just a little bit. And so this is, uh, this is his first mate in this particular case. It's also from the Blackstone Fortress game. Now, he is a rogue, Janice, and then the other guy is a mystic, which are two of like the archetypes that you can build here. But I just kind of wanted to show you here, this is, uh, this is kind of how I've been playing the game, just to kind of give you a sense of the vibe and so on. I grabbed this guy from another Games Workshop board game here. He's sort of a, a cyborg character in this particular world. Obviously, he's a, what do they call it, Adeptus Mechanicus guy, but, um, so I've been kind of theming these up here just to kind of give you a sense of how I've been sort of approaching the game. I was going to play with um, like Star Wars miniatures, uh, but uh, I felt reading through the rule book and kind of the flavor in the background. I was like, this is a very rogue trader vibe I'm getting out of this. So I grabbed some of that. So let's just talk a little bit about some of the different captains and first mates and the type of things that you can do there. So you'll be able to, I think now, even as this video goes live, print out some of the crew sheets here. So you have some space here for your captain, your first mate, then you have your specialist soldiers and stuff like that. You can have up to four specialist soldiers and then up to eight total soldiers. Uh, some of them are free, but some of them you'll have to pay for when you build your warband. You get a certain number of credits uh, to build your, your crew or your warband, and then uh, you'll have some uh, slots here for equipment and so on, but let's look at the book. So the first chapter here, Assembling a Crew. And the first thing you're gonna do here is get a captain. So you've got a biomorph, a cyborg, and so on. And so just to kind of give you some background here, I've actually made four crews and I've played uh, a couple games with some of them and then just one game with some of the others. But I wanted to kind of try out just some of the different stuff that they have. Uh, so like you can see here, the cyborg I shows you here is my little Adeptus Mechanicus guy. Uh, my biomorph was this little uh, Gene Steeler Colts uh, acolyte fellow there. Now again, this is a miniature agnostic game. So there is a line of miniatures coming from North Star, uh, which look really cool, and they're, but they're not out yet, but you can go check, take a look at them. But again, you can use whatever you want. 
So you, just to show you what you got, you got a biomorph, you know, they can change their body, you know, morph, whatever. Cyborgs, kind of robotic. Uh, you've got over here, uh, the Mystic, which is what I had my Inquisitor be. Uh, robotics uh, expert, and that really could be anybody. Uh, I just made this other Gene Stealer cult guy here my robotics expert. So that crew was actually really fun, biomorph slash robot crew. Uh, now most of the uh, characters that you're gonna do should be humanoid, that's what it says. So obviously Janice Drake here, this guy, I mean, that's a human type of character. And this other guy here, this guy, he is humanoid. He's got two legs, a couple of arms, <laughs> and then a head and all that stuff. So it's not like a creature kind of thing. So the idea is that, I mean, it says you can do whatever you want, but sort of the general flavor of it is, is that, you know, this guy wouldn't be like the captain of your starship, for example, right? This might be a creature you encounter in some, you know, forsaken planet or pit. But the idea is to have kind of a humanoid type of character there. But you can label uh, your soldiers as a robot. It says you can't have your captain or your first mate as a robot. And the only difference between a robot and a non-robot character is some of the abilities and things like that uh, that you're gonna get here. And I print out some of the cards that are in the back of the book, but some of the abilities and things like that are gonna interact with robot versus non-robot a little differently. That's all there is to that, really. And then we've got a rogue here. That's what Janice Drake was. I'm like, oh, there's a rogue trader, there's a rogue. A scientist, it's kind of a psychic type of, you know, character, sort of a space wizard. Uh, and then over here, we've got a techer and a veteran there. And so this obviously very, you know, sci-fi techie guy and is more of a combat oriented individual. And just since we're doing some show and tell, I also am a fan of Necromunda, so I grabbed Jericho here, and he's kind of my veteran captain, who's assisted by his Tekker first mate here, which is, I'm brain farting on this guy's name, but he's he's sort of Jericho's buddy there in uh, the Necromunda world. And he's kind of sickly, he's kind of got some gaunt or something going on there. Anyway, so you're gonna choose those, and then if we take a look here, let's zoom in. Now what you're doing here with picking these classes here is you're picking sort of their access they have to these different special abilities that they can use. And one of the differences between Stargrave and Frostgrave is, in Frostgrave you pick a wizard, it's got a school of magic, they're gonna have an apprentice, which is like a first mate, but they have the same school of magic uh, that they belong to, they're just not as good at it, so there's a little bit harder for them to cast the spells. Here, you can have, if you want, two techers. You could have a captain techer and a first mate techer. But you can also have two different ones. So you can kind of dabble in its two different sort of schools of magic or schools of abilities here. But all of these abilities that you can see here are available to everybody. It's not broken into schools. But when you're setting up your character, depending on if it's a first mate or a, a captain, you can pick a certain number of these. A certain number of these have to be picked from the sort of starting core powers. And then you have to pick uh, one or two, depending on how many core powers you pick and based on if you're doing first mate or captain, that are outside their school. So you pick three or four of these, depending on captain versus first mate and so on, and then you pick one or two of the other powers that are outside the school. Now, if we take a look here, let's just grab a fancy one. There's these cards that are in the back of the book that you can print out and cut out. So this one, for example, target lock. This is an activation power of 10. So everything, in the, like I said, is a D20 in this game. So if you try to roll that, and hit that number, then you have activated that special ability. Now, if it's in your core powers and you're the captain, it's gonna be a 10. Although as you level up, you can actually decrease the cost there, and decrease the uh, activation cost. If you are a, a first mate, this is gonna be plus two, so it's gonna actually be a 12, if it's in your core powers list. Now, if it's not in your core powers list and you're a captain, it's also plus two, but if it's not in your core powers list and you're a first mate, it's plus four, so it's actually be a 14. Uh, and then you can actually write that here on the spreadsheet here. So as you put in the, the powers there, this is the activation. And then you can change the activation cost. I think that I changed anything on this one. No, not this particular team yet. But uh, you can change some of these here. And there's a strain. So you're going to take one point of hit point damage there on some of these. So this is kind of a, a up-to-date how much does this power cost kind of thing. And you will definitely want to print these out in some form. And this gives you all the details. And there's some more details in the book, you know, for specifics of how to use the powers. So that's kind of what these are. And these also, you will have some modifications to your stats. So if you chose a Tekker here, you see you get plus two to your will, and then choose two of the following, plus one move, fight, shoot, or health. So if we look over here, we can see here is your basic stats for starting captain. Six move, three fight, two strength, 
nine armor, three will, 16 health. So the other thing, the techer, you get two will, so you get plus five to your will instead of plus three, and you can give the plus one to a couple of other slots there. And you have similar stats, but also not quite as good to your first mate. So when you pick a first mate, same idea, and then you'll apply uh, whatever the modifiers are based on their class. And then you're gonna recruit soldiers here. And you're always gonna have eight soldiers, and you've got two tables here. So you've got the standard soldier table here, and you can see some of these are free. So if these die over the course of the campaign, no big deal, you just replace them. And they start with some basic equipment, uh, and that's what they have here. Some of them do have a cost, and they've got different stats and stuff like that. And then over here you have the specialist table, and these are gonna cost a little bit more. See, they get up high, and even like the armored trooper down here, 150, and they have better equipment, so on. They have better skills. Notably, they'll have a better will, and the will is it's a very important thing, which we'll talk about in a minute. But so your specialists are gonna be a little bit better, and these are a little bit more uh, sacred to you. You don't necessarily want to lose them. Now, the other thing you're gonna do is equip your captain and your first mate. Your captain has six slots, your first mate has five, and then you choose these things here. These are gonna be little things basically helping you sort of hack and find treasures and uh, weapons and all that kind of stuff. Some of the stuff will take up different numbers of slots, uh, for example. Uh, so uh, shotguns, for example, though, that's just a key thing. I, I was having a hard time finding, I'm like, how come soldiers can't have shotguns? Well, they can, because if, if anybody has a carbine, you can just swap that out for a shotgun. They both take up two slots. They work a little bit differently. Uh, the carbine has a 24 inch range, or the pistol has a 10, it's kind of your default weapon. The shotgun has a 12 inch range, but has plus one damage. And the carbine again and the shotgun take up two slots. There's also a rapid fire gun, which takes up three slots but you can get special abilities and stuff that's going to adjust that. The other thing that's new with this that's very different than uh, Frostgrave is you've got here the concept here of, well, it's more shooty oriented in general because you've got all these guns, but you've got grenades. You've also got here uh, grenade launchers and flamethrowers. And there are templates here in the back, since we keep referring to the back of the book here, like this, you can print that out if you wish. And again, here's some of the cards, so to speak, that you can sort of print out and cut out. And there's a little crew sheet here that you can you can download a lot of this stuff though uh, from their website or you will be able to very soon but if you have some of the 40k stuff like this flame template here is the exact same uh, dimensions pretty much and then this explosion which is for a kind of a frag grenade explosion grenade same size as that template there this one doesn't really you can't really find these so i did print these out these are smoke templates here and i just scanned and print out some pdf and so if you can, you can actually have smoke grenades, which are gonna mess with line of sight and stuff like that. So I'm not gonna get too much in the specifics of how each of these weapons work. How it should work a little bit differently. I will talk about them in the review part though. And so here you can see kind of the general uh, shorthand for all the weapons. So you'll choose and equip that with your captain and your first mate before you get started. And the book has really nice art. So there is a sort of basic kind of scenario that you can set up and play. Just you know, fill the board with terrain, uh, pick table edges to deploy, put a treasure token in the center of the table, the exact center, and then the players will take turns deploying two treasure tokens each. But there's two different kinds of treasure in this game, which we'll talk about in a minute. And the deployment rules are different than in Frostgrave. There, I, I think I like them better because they kind of, I think they kind of stop you from hosing yourself by a bad treasure placement because there's some very strict but simple rules where you kind of have to, you have to place them on the other side of the board across from you on your opponent's side, but so does your opponent and that kind of thing. So it's kind of interesting how that's a little bit different here, a little bit more precise. But the phases here, so after everything's deployed, you're gonna go turn by turn, you have initiative, so each player is gonna roll off uh, D20s. Whoever gets the highest is gonna go first. And they're gonna activate their captain. And if the captain is surrounded by, let's say, he's got a couple of soldiers around him within three inches of him, up to three. Let's just say we have the two for right now. You activate him and anybody else around him. And then the other team will go and they'll activate their captain and anybody else around them within three inches, up to three figures. So when you deploy, you kinda of wanna bunch them up. And then we'll go into the first mate phase and then they will you know, whoever had the initiative will activate the first mate, anybody that's up to three inches within them. And then back and forth, the other side will go to the first mate phase. And then the soldier phase is any kind of straggling soldiers that have moved away from your 
you know, your leaders, you'll take turns activating one soldier at a time back and forth. Now when you activate, you can do two things. You can do a move and something else. So you can't like shoot twice or fight twice, although there are some special things that you can get to kind of break that rule sometimes. But effectively, you can either move or fight, you do combat, you can try to unlock a treasure token because you can't just pick it up necessarily. You have to unlock it, that's just built right into the game. And you have two different types of treasure tokens. You got physical tokens and then data tokens. So I just kind of have these little computer screen looking things and these here that actually have like a little treasure inside of them. Uh, so to open these, just the general basic open is you're gonna make a will test. You have to hit a 14 on a D20 adding your will. So in that case, I rolled a 20, so obviously I opened it. But your leaders and your specialists have a decent bonus to their will. And it doesn't matter if it's data or loot, unless the scenario gives you some other options there. Now, if you open the token there, you actually get the experience points for the scenario for actually unlocking it right away. And if it's a data one, or excuse me, if it's a physical one, you get the item and you just are carrying it right away. Whereas if you unlock a data one, and I just been using these little clear dice here for like little data cubes. Uh, this actually has to have another action taken to pick this up and take it. So it's basically two actions here. And remember, one of your actions has to be a move. Is, so you've got one action to make the will roll to unlock it, and another one to pick it up. So that's kind of a two turn thing. But once you have a data token, you can just move around as normal. If you have a physical loot token, it halves your movement. So if you're of a movement of six, you can only move three. And it also gives you minus one to your fight and to your shoot. So you can pick this up and go and start running, but it's gonna slow you down. This one is a little bit more of a process to sort of, you know, dig out, so to speak. So real basic idea of the uh, actions here. Like I said, you can move. Most things can move six. So I've got a little template here, so you can move six, boom, just like normal movement. If you wanna move again, which you can do, you can move twice, your next movement will be half. So if this guy had six movement, I could move six plus another three. So I can move a total of, you know, that's about nine there. So that's gonna be two movement there. That's kind of like a run. If you're gonna shoot at somebody here, you're gonna make a roll test here. And this is how you do all the tests in the game. So let's say this guy's the black, that guy's the blue. You're gonna take and add this guy's shoot stat, which I'll just grab a random character here. So you can see he's got a shoot of plus two. So he's gonna roll the d20 and add two. And let's say this guy has a fight stat here of plus three. He will roll kind of as a defense roll and add the three. So two to three. So we've got six, two, that was a terrible roll, to four. So he beat him. So you're gonna take his total roll, in this case six, which is not gonna do any good. You're gonna subtract the armor here. So this guy, you see how I have this written like nine slash 10. So he's wearing a little bit of extra armor that gives him the bonus. The kind of the default armor is about nine. So, but he's got 10 armor. So I've got six total, four plus two is six. You take that and then you say, oh, well, I can't even get up above his armor. So I'm not gonna do any damage. But let's say we had a roll like this. We had 18 and let's say you got a 13, right? So we're gonna add the two here, that's 20. And then the three or 16. So I beat him, so I won. Then I'm gonna take my total here, 20, and I'm gonna look at his armor now. I'm gonna say, oh, he's got 10 armor, so 20 minus 10, that's 10 damage. I would take this character down to 10 health, or five health, excuse me, because you have 15 minus the 10. So a couple things to keep in mind here. First of all, since we're talking about damage, if you take more than four damage, then that's going to, I'm sorry, I should say four or more damage, that's gonna actually stun uh, that character and it just says to roll them on the side. So what a stun character is, they basically have plus two on their fight rolls against shooting attacks, so because you kind of hunker down, so it gives you a little bit of a defensive bonus there. But if somebody comes into contact with you and does combat, you're gonna actually have minus two to your fight. And then what's gonna happen if somebody does come into contact with you, you'll just stand up and then you'll have your fight there. But if it becomes to your turn and you're gonna activate this figure here, uh, what they can do is they can stand up and then they only get one action instead of their two. Because effectively you've used an action kind of unstunning yourself. The other thing to note is on a 20, it is an automatic success and that's a critical success on an attack. And that's gonna do an additional five damage on top of what other, other damage that you do. Now on a shooting attack, if you do a one, that's actually gonna jam up your weapon or you're gonna kinda like 
sort of run out of ammo for a second. So you've got to take an action to sort of reload or unjam or fix your weapon. And those aren't optional rules. They had a similar rule in Frostgrave that was kind of optional, but I always like playing with it. Uh, but that's not an optional rule here. Now in combat, direct combat here, you can do an action to fight. But in the fight, you can actually get hit back. So let's say, let's say they both have plus two fight. So black and blue, let's see. So, oh, they got a tie there. So they would tie, in the case of a tie, actually, you would both do damage to each other, but they ro both rolled so poorly. Well, let's say we did like this here. So a similar idea here, you do that, so that'd be 20 to 13, 20 again applied to the armor, then you can push them off an inch and so on if you wanted to, yeah, as the winner. Uh, same idea there with the combat, but you're just comparing fights in that case. Oh, I should say the other thing about combat here. So if you do move within an inch of somebody, it'll kind of force snap you together. So you can't like sneak around people too much. And then that'll sort of force the engagement. Uh, if you are engaged though, it will, uh, you basically have to fight them. You can't really take an action. You've got to be able to fight them and push them off and stuff so you can get out. Now, if you're fighting, let's say t these two guys here were on the same team, they would be fighting. So if he does a fight action there, he's going to get a plus two because he's got a buddy there uh, helping out. Unless this buddy was fighting, let's say this guy here, I was over there and this was on the same team, so he would be kind of occupied and could contribute uh, that bonus there. So it does a good little example here of giving you some examples of like, you know, who's on what team and would they get the bonus or not. But it's pretty straightforward. It usually never gets that complicated when you've got so many people all kind of stacked up like that. Now, we also have here a creature phase here. So we've got creature actions. And one thing that's gonna happen is the scenarios that I'm gonna show you here in a second are gonna kind of provide and say, hey, in, when you're using this scenario, use this kind of rule here to spawn a certain kind of creature and so on. But there's also like random tables you could roll on to spawn creatures and cause havoc. And that's one of the things with Frostgrave and Stargrave uh, that kind of sets it apart is there is a, usually a lot of NPC characters that you're having to deal with that are really gumming up the plans and the works for everybody. Now, typically, whenever you unlock a token, then you will roll a die and on a 10 plus, then you will spawn this uh, whatever you, you want based on the scenario, or you know you can just pick one out, or you can, there's a whole random table. You'll spawn one if you roll above a 10, and then you're gonna roll and see where they come on the board. So you do like this and say like, okay, see how that's pointed down here? You look at the number on the D20 and say, oh, there's the top of the number, point this way. So this guy would come in on this table edge down here at the bottom. Or if I rolled it and it was pointed that way, we would take a line and draw all the way over there, so they'd spawn on that table edge over there. So that's kind of your basic sort of, you know, random creature generation thing. Whenever you unlock one of these, you roll, if you get above a 10, and then you roll the direction, and you see where they come in at. But a lot of the scenarios have, you know, specific things that will trigger creature spawning and stuff. Now what they're gonna do is, if a creature's in combat with uh, one of the characters, this is gonna fight it, otherwise it's gonna look in line of sight and move up far enough to be able to shoot it, or get it in close combat with it and fight it. And if it has a ranged weapon, it'll say on its profile if it can shoot. And then sometimes the scenario will specify a target point, which might be whatever the closest treasure is or the center of the map or something. And so then creatures will, if none of the above are true, they have no line of sight to anybody, it'll just try to maneuver and get close to the target point. Or again, it might roll and move a random direction. And so you just kind of move it that way until it gets in the line of sight and stuff for future activations. So I should say here, before we talk about campaigns, we have ending the game. So once you pull the last uh, sort of loot token off of the board, that's gonna end the game. Or if one side wipes out the other side completely, then you'll kind of randomly determine uh, if any of the loot tokens are sort of floating around and haven't been picked up yet, if the team that remains gets them. And then you're gonna kind of divvy up all that stuff and roll for injuries. So you get in the campaign section here, uh, you're gonna roll on these tables based on if it's soldiers or captains or whatnot. They might die permanently. Uh, they might get some kind of permanent injury. They might recover and so on. Uh, and then you've got a whole list of permanent injuries here, which, you know, funny thing, I've played this, I think, five times now. <laughs> I've not got a permanent injury yet. I've had some people die, but no permanent injuries. Uh, then you've got the experience here, which I actually printed out because you wanna keep track of this actually during the game. And this is, uh, I would say relatively different than Frostgrave, but also significantly different in some ways. So just so you know, when you play a game, you're playing a campaign, you get 30 points just for playing the game. If one of your crew has at least one figure reduced to zero health, you get another 30. So that means you probably fought a team, you know, that was, uh, you know, worth your salt. Uh, you didn't just walk over a team. And then you get 20, plus 20 for each loot token unlocked by a member of the crew. 
And then for each power you activate, well, which I didn't talk about, I did kind of at the beginning, but for each of these powers here, you activate that. I'll talk about more of those in the review, but uh, for each successful one, you get plus 10 there. And you will notice here, you don't get experience for unsuccessful powers. In Frostgrave, you, just, you get five points, at least in second edition, uh, five points uh, for unsuccessful activations. Um, and then for each rival crew member that you basically kill or knock out, you get plus 10. And for each uncontrolled creature, like the little ruffians I was showing you there, uh, you get plus five for those, but up to a max of 20 in that case, and up to a max of 100 for the successful activations. So this is good stuff to keep track of. And the scenarios and stuff might have specific things that give you specific kinds of experience. Uh, the other thing that's different here with Stargrave over Frostgrave is when you level up. Now, your captain, is actually starts as level 15. So this guy here is a level 15 fella. Your, uh, uh, I almost called him your apprentice, your first mate is starts at level zero. So at any point after the game, it's always 100 experience to level up either your captain or your first mate. So your captain is at level 15. So if he levels up, he'll go to level 16 and you can see he'll actually get lower in activation number. So you can see I did that with this particular case here on a restructure. I actually lowered that debt to a nine when I leveled up this character here. That was my biomorph. Um, so you can see that for my first level up, I lowered that down from a 10 to a nine. And then the same kind of thing here, when you go from level zero to level one, you can lower an activation number. And when I get my first mate to level two, I have to improve a stat. So the way that you take your choice here is it forces you to kind of diversify. Instead of like when you level up in Frostgrave, you could just say, I'm gonna level up my stats, 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 stats. So my fight stat is just, you know, whatever the max is. And there is a max you can see down here. So, um, so that's kind of, a, it's a more strict leveling guide here. And there's a little bit of a different thing here with the, the how you level up and replace if your captain dies, uh, which is an interesting thing, which I'll talk about in the review part. Um, okay, so we'll keep going. Now for each item, so we've got the data token here and then the physical token here, you're gonna roll on this using a D20. So if I had one of each, I'd roll a D20 for each one. That one, I got a 12, so I would get an advanced weapon. This one, I got a 10, another advanced weapon. But you can get all kinds of stuff here. This is kind of free loot that you can get. And some of it might just be straight up credits. Sometimes you could trade information or secrets for experience points, or the secrets are actually interesting because you can sort of make a bet with it on the next scenario you play that you get the central loot token. Because remember, one loot token is always in the center. It's a cool little mechanic there. Uh, it may give you a description here of all this stuff. Let me zoom out a bit. So you've got different weapons with more damage and just all kinds of little gadgets and stuff like that. That's useful. Um, and some of these are really cool. And if you were to buy them, they're very expensive. But you can actually, after we do all this stuff, we flip ahead just a little bit. Uh, you can buy new soldiers if you need to. You can also just fire soldiers and not worry about it. Like some of the free soldiers, you don't have to even worry about it. They die, oh, big deal. And then you just hire a new one for free. Um, but they will you know, lose any of the equipment and stuff that you might have assigned to them as well. So you maybe you get a new captain, a new first mate, that kind of stuff. You have ships here, which is kind of like the bases. Uh, so you can do in a ship uh, improvement, which is very expensive. Uh, and you don't really start with any of these. You kind of just have a generic ship and then you can start to upgrade it and so on. Uh, and there's some other optional things here. So I think here's this, oh, all the different powers, which I'm gonna talk about in the review. And then you have here this different scenarios here, and there's 10 scenarios that you can play through. Uh, and again, these have very specific uh, terrain requirements, but 100% feel like you can ignore those, and I'll talk more about that in the review. Um, and then here's the bestiary, so again, some of the random monsters and stuff like that that you have, and then that's pretty much it. And then there's all these other templates and stuff. And that is kind of the general overview of that. So let's talk about the important part now. That would be the main review. Okay, so that was a general kind of overview there of Stargrave. So let's jump into kind of the review part of it. And I will kind of try to stick to my three pillars of reviews, but I'm gonna do a lot of kind of compare and contrast with Frostgrave uh, and with some other games like Necromunda and stuff like that. So first of all, player count and playtime. I've only been soloing this. Like I said, I made up the four war bands. And basically, I, so I have uh, the captain and the first mate in each one are different from each other. So I have played with all eight of the classes, so to speak, I mean, to a certain degree. Uh, a couple of the warbands only played one game with them 
and then I played a few other games with the other two. Uh, so that's been kind of my, my gist of it. In the game, the scenarios um, have been about an hour or so, almost two hours sometimes, because I'm also like studying the spells, or not the spells, but the abilities and stuff like that, and trying to get a gist of you know how they kind of work and how the scenarios work. Now the last few games that I've played have been a lot quicker. They've been about 45 minutes to an hour. But I'm also like taking my time because I'm by myself and I'm not in a big rush when I'm doing this because I'm having a good time, spoiler alert, for the review part. But so um, I have played, I will say in terms of player count, I have played multiplayer games of Frostgrave and I really have enjoyed those. Uh, they're a lot of fun. You know, it's just a, a big fun kind of, you know, free for all, big bash kind of thing. I do prefer as a two player game though. I like the head to head kind of tactical back and forth kind of stuff uh, going on. And the one thing that Frostgrave and Stargrave have is kind of that addition of the sort of the third party AI monsters that come in and just kind of wreck everybody's day. Uh, so I feel like that's kind of plenty uh, for me. Um, so anyway, that's that's kind of the play count, play time. And then my next pillar, my last pillar is kind of, you know, what is this game like? Well, it's like Star or Frostgrave in space. <laughs> and I think that's what people have been wanting. I've seen some a lot of stuff online because I'm a part of the different Facebook groups and stuff for Frostgrave. And, and stuff, and they're like, oh, you know, it's just Frostgrave in space. And I'm like, haven't people been <laughs> asking for that for like, you know, since uh, Frostgrave came out? And I'm like, well, that's, I mean, I've been asking for that. That's what I wanted. Um, so, but there is a thing of like, you know, let's just reskin it and have the abilities be the spells and, you know, the captain and the first mate is the wizard and the apprentice. And it's, you know, how close is it? Uh, you know, and is it just kind of a reskin? You know, there's not really any. Sort of effort or anything like that and i don't think that's the case though uh, in this case well let's break it down because i think there is a probably a couple of things that i could be real nitpicky about and be critical about uh, but I, I will be just to kind of you know throw the discussion out there um, so the couple of things here is it's you're still sticking with the d20 in this case that you had in Frostgrave. And I know a lot of people sort of don't like the d20 system and that's one of the reasons the main reason they don't like Frostgrave. so obviously if you don't like the D20, which can be random, and it can be you know very swingy because you can have you know a plus six fight character going against a plus two fight character, which you'd think should be a huge deal, but the D20 there's so much variability in there that it's it ends up you know the the lesser character wins you know and kills the other one like outright because they get a crit. Now for me in Frostgrave, I love that because. Um, the theme of that system in that game is such an interesting thing. It was like so wizard centric, which is magic sort of bouncing off the walls of these old ruins. It's perfect. And I just loved how it worked in there. And it gives you kind of D and D vibe and that kind of stuff. And it just allows for some really dramatic big moments. And his other game that he's got Rangers of Shadow Deep, which is like a solo version of this kind of similar system. It really works well in there as well. Uh, I like it here, but I can see some opening for criticism here because, okay, it's science fiction, which should be a little bit more grounded in sort of statistics a little bit more for some reason, just because it's science-y and space, you know, uh, why, why don't the weapons have, you know, gun sights on them and stuff? Why wouldn't you be more accurate than, you know, in tampering with the elemental systems to you know cast spells which is kind of like a weird crazy thing that's you know completely in a different world whereas this is somewhat grounded in our world to a certain extent it's using guns and flamethrowers and grenades and all this kind of stuff um so i can see that being that but i think the way uh that the setting and everything is set up here where it's like you are a bunch of like just haphazard pirate ships basically in space and your crews are just you know kind of thrown together you're just kind of trying to eke out uh you know an existence in this like wasteland of space i think in that for, for that reason almost for maybe for that reason alone the d20 makes a lot of sense here because these aren't necessarily highly trained you know military types of figures these are just you know you and me or whatever that are just trying to eke out an existence and get by and so the power scale and the pow power difference between just random people off the street, so to speak, meeting each other can be pretty high, the variance there. Um, so I think it makes sense here and it's also familiar. And again, in this case as well, it adds to kind of the dramatic 
super swingy, funny, hilarious <laughs> events that happen. And so I really like that he, he stuck with that here. Uh, I could see people want to tweak that and want something different, but there's a bunch of other games that are frankly D6 sci-fi skirmish games that I'm like, those games feel just as random as this, even though they use D6s, you know? I'm like, I don't know, I don't really, I mean, D20, granted, granted math says it's swingier, but I'm like, well, I played enough games of Kill Team and Tech Necromunda and whatever else. And I'm like, well, this is as random as that. So I don't know that the dice makes that much difference sometimes. Um, it, I think it's just, it's more of a storytelling device than a mechanical device sometimes. It's, I know, we could probably debate that to the end of the earth, but anyway, that's what it kind of feels like. So, okay, so taking that step from the D20. Now, the idea here of the captain first mate, I think that works perfectly. I like how you can be a different captain and first mate, like different classes. That's really neat because then you can kind of dabble you know, into kind of different schools of magic or schools of thought uh, where you have kind of the robotics engineer and you can sort of, you know, have these abilities to kind of remotely operate one of your robot soldiers and stuff. Or, you know, you've got the, um, um, you know, the, the rogue guy who has some kind of cool sort of, um, uh, I don't want to say this, but like he plays with luck a lot. And then he also has like some stuff where you can like haggle and get a better deal on things like that after the game, which can come in handy. It doesn't help you during the game, but you can sell equipment and get a little bit of a better, uh, you know, value for your, what you sell and stuff like that. And, um, you know, they have this thing called, I think it's called fortune where they get kind of like a mitigated, uh, baked in reroll for their next action and stuff like that. Um, one of the other, some other things, you know, one of the guys can like camouflage themselves and some people have like, you know, they can give them like a, a vibro electric blade and do that or, uh, the one biomorph guy can like go underground, you know, he can like basically move through terrain by going underground and coming up. So it allows you kind of just dabble. You're not like focused on this one, you know, kind of uh, uh, school of magic or school of, of abilities. You can have two different ones and that's really neat. Now, the interesting thing about this though, is it's a little bit, I would say on brutal on on paper anyway if your captain dies in this case whereas in frostgrave you kind of like level up your apprentice and you think your apprentice has to be to level five or something or with the, you might as well just start over if your apprentice or if your wizard hasn't got to level five and your apprentice moves up blah blah, blah. so in this because they kind of level separately you kind of level individually the captain and the first mate whereas in frostgrave if you level the wizard up your apprentice kind of goes up too so to speak um this is different because you want to get that apprentice leveled up to, I think it's level 10, because at that point, then it will, you can graduate it to be a captain. And then it, you don't basically have to restart your whole war band if your captain does die. So it's, it seems like it's geared towards leveling up your apprentice first, or not your first mate first, um, which is very different. Like you want to focus on leveling that character up, get them to the quality of where they are basically an equal to your captain, which to me is like, I don't know if he did it on purpose, he probably did, but that is usually like the storyline that you you see in a lot of the sci-fi is you're trying to, the first mate is always kind of hanging out, da da da, and you, you know, you like took him under your wing, and then always in like at the point of the movie or the book where you're reading it, you're always reading it where the first mate is like just as good as the captain, and the captain kind of knows it, and the first mate kind of knows it, and so there's a good kind of tension, usually depending on the relationship there, you know, in the story. But where the captain is like that whole like relying on the first mate um, to take over, but the captain still kind of doubts him a little bit, and the whole master and, and apprentice kind of idea there. I think that's a really kind of interesting thing here because it is kind of a master and apprentice, but you really want to focus on the apprentice and leveling up the apprentice or the first mate in this case. Um, in that way. That's kind of an interesting little little nugget like that. So that's pretty cool. Um, now the other thing to talk about here with some of the differences is the way the shooting works and not just you know the D20 part of it, but the fact that you have grenades and grenade launchers and smoke grenades and uh, flamethrowers. So those are very interesting. Now when I read the grenade stuff on paper, I'm like, well, uh, you can just grenade spam the whole game. But the grenades are not really like that powerful. They're not like wipe out. Because like, think about it, if you're using a grenade in a skirmish game, you're like, okay, well I blew up an area. There's only one guy there. Whereas if you use it in a big mass battle game, like 40K, like, okay, I blew up the whole unit or half the unit because of this grenade. 
Um, so because you have unlimited grenades, if you have the grenades equipment, you can just do whatever you want. But by default, they only go six inches. Okay, that's not that far. But you can throw them over terrain. That's cool. But they don't really do that much extra damage or anything like that. And if they bounce, they could bounce back on you. They could bounce somewhere else. Because uh, if they miss, you'll kind of roll and then they'll move a little bit, um, theoretically. If you miss by uh, enough, they don't won't go anywhere. It'll just be a dud. Um, so I was like, okay, that's actually kind of cool. Because it's like this, you're not just going to spam it because you're only going to do it about six inches away or 16 if you have the grenade launcher. But if you use the grenade launcher, then you have some penalties from the launcher anyway because it's kind of coming out and they're all wobbly and stuff. Um, and that costs you some equipment slots and so on. Um, so it's that kind of interesting how you can, how they, how he, he treated the grenade part of it. So it's a very tactical use still, um, but it's not a super high power damage thing. So that's neat. Uh, and the flamethrower is a similar kind of thing. Now flamethrower does have a plus two damage, I think. And, but you have that short kind of nine inch arc basically. And it's just going to auto hit and just do basically a built in, um, a fire attack. I don't remember what the b bonus modifier is on that. But um, yeah, so that's kind of an interesting thing and it, it will like, you know, kind of go around cover a little bit and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so that's kind of a neat thing too. I do want to talk about um, the smoke grenades. And that's pretty cool because, you know, you fire up a smoke grenade and that'll protect the line of sight. And that comes in a lot handier than you might think sometimes because, um, you know, just not being able to be seen by either the other team or the creatures is, is super handy, <laughs> uh, especially the creatures, because you can kind of do it and sort of hide and then move off, especially if you have like a big creature in there. I mean, one of the, my favorite scenarios is there's one with a, um, it's just like a sewer dragon that starts off, which is a pretty tough creature, but it has these vents that are like spitting out smoke, which will do damage to your character if you're standing next to it, but also like has these sort of like oscillating, like line of sight blockers that are going all over the place. It's a really cool kind of fun scenario and it gets you really into the game where you're like, you know, trying to get over to this treasure to get it because it's all smoky and you're like, I can get in here and nobody can shoot me, but if this thing goes off again, then it's gonna, you know, just do an attack damage on me and all that stuff. Uh, so playing with that kind of thing is really neat. Um, and there's some certain powers and stuff that are will play with the game. The one thing that's a little bit Gosh, and this is this is like the nittiest of nitpicks. Um, so when you activate a power, I didn't explain this in the walkthrough part, but you activate just like Frostgrave a spell, you roll and you try to get the t activation number, and you take strain damage possibly, which is more like Ghost Archipelago, had that kind of thing. But you can also like exert and basically lose hit points if you fail the uh, skill activation. So if I rolled a 10 and I needed a 12, I'll take whatever strain damage is there and I can spend two more hit points if I want to get it up to 12 and then do it. And in Frostgrave, it made sense because you were like sort of like blood magic, you know, like magic energy is sort of taking your soul a little bit or whatever. But in this, it's like, well, what if I try to do a target lock on something, you know, uh, why would it cost me my hit points? But again, because of this sort of setting in this case, um, and I don't think I'm making excuses here. I think it makes sense because two parts of this. One, I like it mechanically because it allows you to kind of push your luck and spend a little bit of hit points to kind of pull off that extra little cool ability, but you're, you know, you're kind of gauging and trying to judge how much you should give up. So that's a cool mechanic. I love that kind of mechanic. It's like a little resource that you've got or that you can spend. Um, but also the setting and the theme, because again, these guys have old equipment that's just been abandoned. You know, they've jacked into this some you know, cyborgian, cybernetic kind of thing that maybe does damage to them when it makes them twitch or something when they try to do the special ability. Uh, so it kind of makes sense that way. Um, like this is not, you know, like the Empire in Star Wars or 40K or something where they're, you know, they got all their stuff together, you know, or whatever. Um, so this is all just ra haphazard random equipment. So I think it makes sense to do that. Although it's kind of like, ah, oh, he did that again. But, you know, whatever. That's just a, the smallest nitpick uh, that I can think of there. Now, a lot of the other kind of uh, tactical movement ability type of stuff like that, um, real similar to Frostgrave. You know, if you want to go pop over and watch those reviews of that, that, that kind of stuff is really neat. The whole, like, you only get a movement thing and an action. It's very simple, but it also makes the tactics of it pretty cool. And the, the way that the treasures work differently here um, because the data loot tokens and the physical loot tokens, that really does affect, you know, 
the strategy in the game. The fact that you have to kind of wait a little bit longer for data and then the loot, the physical loot will slow you down and that kind of stuff. Uh, the last thing I'll kind of mention here is, I know I showed you a big board full of terrain. Um, and I don't think that it's necessary. And this is one thing that I, I think I made a mistake with, with Frostgrave actually originally. And I saw a lot of people making this mistake. So, you know, I kind of like bought into this whole thing of like, oh, okay, I need to have this certain number of zombies and I need to have a uh, frost giant and I need to have a little hut and a little well and a little thing like this and that and that and that's kind of how You know, I played that game where I was like, okay so He wants very specific stuff for us to do in his scenarios and that's not the case and um, he, I've actually heard him say this to me in person <laughs> uh, is don't even trip about that just um, Just put it together and kind of have the gist of the scenario and I kind of broke out of that sort of mindset when I played Rangers of Shadow Deep because I had like none of the stuff in there. But I'm like, okay, well basically this is difficult terrain and this should be hard to get at. And this might be have some walls. Okay, maybe the walls could be trees. Maybe this, in this particular uh, game, Stargrave, you know, it says you want a crashed spaceship. And I was like, well, I have a really nice looking spaceship that I painted for my Death Watch Army. And I'm like, this one look crashed. I didn't like it. I'm like, I put that in the middle of the table. But you know what I did? I built like this sort of collapsed sort of grouping of uh, storage containers that had like a gun mounted on it and the gun would like fire at all of the characters that are trying to approach it it was like just there was an accident and exploded and this gun became active because that's what the scenario called for was a crashed ship that had an active gun and it has a really cool treasure token in the middle of it that players want to get that gave you extra experience so as long as you get like the gist of the rules right and kind of the the idea behind the scenario i mean he's got a whole bunch of stuff here that are like each scenario is on like a completely different planet. And I'm like, I don't, I don't have a train for all these different settings. So I'm like, you know what? All of this stuff sounds crazy. I'm going to put it in a Necromunda underworld underhive setting. And the one that had, uh, it was like on a flying cloud planet. And I'm like, I don't have, there's no way. I'm not even going to try to get that terrain. Um, you know, and so I was like, you know, it'll just be like holes in the top of the hive world that, you know, players can get, jump out and get sucked out over something or some anti-gravitational anti force that's like this weird anomaly in this middle of this giant hive. So you can just kind of play with that stuff. And so I say that's something that, um, you know, you should keep in mind with this. And the other thing is, um, so just kind of end on a little bit of a note here looking forward to it. I'm gonna talk about two things Frostgrave related. So we know there's one expansion at least coming out for Stargrave. And it sounds like it's gonna be the Perilous Dark book, um, which is the solo sort of uh, add-on for Frostgrave. Now there's also a recent one here called The Red King, which I just got this one as well. I haven't really had a chance to look at this one yet. But, so what I've seen people are doing is they are taking kind of the perilous dark rules and applying them to some of the uh, more narrative campaign parts of Frostgrave. Like there's the Lich, the Lich one thaw of the something Lich Lord. I forget the name of it. I'm looking at it right there. And then uh, there's another one. And then there's the new Red King one. And they're taking these basic rules here and then applying that. But with that same mindset I talked about as far as the terrain goes, we're like, okay, I've got the rules here and I got that. So if I do this and this and that, and I think it will take some practice to do that. Um, so I am looking forward to that next Stargrave expansion, which will have solo rules for Stargrave and apparently some kind of er other narrative piece to it. Because this is the thought I wanted to leave you with with this is the system's great, the, the mechanics are great, everything's great. But the thing that I think, um, and I don't think everybody really thinks this, but it seems like sometimes it's overlooked for me is the like the kind of the world building that happens with specifically Joseph McCullough's games and with Frostgrave, Rangers of Shadowdeep, and I think hopefully here in the future with Stargrave. Um, because in Frostgrave, when you had the first book, you had this idea that you would get to this transcendence level as a wizard. That was your basic thing. You, know, you had some scenarios. You had the generic kind of uh, scenario generator procedural thing that you can play through. You just kind of played around and then theoretically leveled your wizard up till they got to level 20 or whatever the thing is, and then they ascended into the higher wizard plane. Now this one doesn't really give you anything to say that you won the campaign, which I don't think is necessary, like a lot of times. Um, uh, what game was it? There was, uh, oh, there was Star Breach, and I think it was Kings of War Vanguard. The way that they really had the, camp the campaign conclusion stuff was, was really neat. Go watch those reviews there. 
Um, but this one doesn't really have that. It's just kind of like, mm, just kind of adventure, and then maybe you're rich, you know, a little bit at the end. So what I think where Frostgrave really came into its own and Ranger of Shadow Deep is you have these kind of narrative structures and these little settings that you can go through where maybe there's like a big bad or something. So in the middle of your sort of pirate space pirate fight, you have this big bad that you're trying to sort of uh, semi-cooperatively take down as you're trying to be, get rich and stuff. And once the Stargrave system kind of adds in a lot of that flavor and that background and all that setting stuff, I think it's really going to be... Um, in a good spot to compete with Frostgrave because I've already been asked, you know, Frostgrave or Stargrave, and I would say Star Frostgrave for sure because there's all this stuff for it and you can do all these things with it. There's all these settings and adventures and uh, campaigns and storylines and everything that you can go down. And there's just also this Perilous Dark supplement, which I, having seen people online now go through and like replay the lich thing as a solo or cooperative campaign, I'm like, oh man, that sounds really cool because I really like Rangers of Shadow Deep. Um, so it'd be cool to kind of do that. So I'm very curious to see how that's going to take off and look. So this is, to me, like, I think this could could have maybe had a little bit more in, in it. Because it just has, like, ten scenarios and then you're done. And then you can just play random scenarios. But it's like, well, what do we, what's our, like, our motivation here, you know? Um, but I think the expansion book will kind of add that along. Um, and maybe give you some kind of, like, campaign conclusion and stuff like that. But as it is, like, this, these basic core rules... I think are really gonna, um, you know, give you a good starting into the system. And if you've got a bunch of like Necromunda and Rogue Trader type models laying around, this is just perfect uh, for that setting. Okay, I think I rambled on way too much, uh, but at the end of the day, I really enjoyed this. If you've been looking for Frostgrave in space, it's already here. <laughs> and uh, take a look at it, thanks.